Hello, I'm Oliver Gam of Dreinschlag. I'm currently working as an anatomical pathology resident at the big Viennese hospital. And this is my lecture about wounds with swords and other similar pointy objects. In general, I'll focus on lethal wounds. I can already hear you saying, but Oliver, shouldn't this lecture be, be held by a forensic pathologist? And to that I'll say, duh. But we don't have one in Dreinschlag, so I'll have to suffice. A short disclaimer, I will be using drawings and short animations for illustrative purposes, but I will not be using pictures of real corpses for reasons of, well, basic human decency. Also, I don't want to get fired. Okay, so where to start? Oh, I know. Let's start with a wound man, a figure in many old medical texts made to showcase various physical wounds of the human body. This one is taken from the 1491 Venetian print of the Fasciculus Medicine, the first printed medical text with illustrations known to us, or to me. Okay, so let's start with the thorax, since it's one of the primary targets in fencing. I'll be talking about wounds to the heart, the aorta, the lungs and the intercoastal arteries. The heart is located in the middle of the thorax and surrounded by a fibrous sac, the pericardium. In a healthy adult, it roughly has the size of the fist of its owner. As you probably know, it has four chambers, two atria and two ventricles. It is a muscle, so it can contract to expulse the blood inside but it can only feel passively once the blood pressure within its ventricles drops to a point where it is lower than in the atrium. The heart valves pretty much only function as backflow valves. They direct the bloodstream so that the heart doesn't pump the blood back through the veins. Now, what happens if we puncture the ventricles? Well, that varies. If it is punctured by a very fine needle, probably nothing. If it is neatly cut in half by a very broad blade, it will instantly cease to function. However, outside of these extremes, a wound to the muscle of the heart will lead to some blood being expulsed into the pericardial sac during each heartbeat. While the heart may initially still function normally, in time, the pericardial sac will fill up and exert pressure on the heart and the venous vessels leading into the heart. When this happens, the heart won't be able to fill during the relaxation of the ventricles and consequently won't be able to keep the arterial blood pressure where it's supposed to be, leading to unconsciousness and death. Obviously, there are other ways the heart can be damaged by a stabbing weapon. For example, the valves may be damaged to the point where they cease to function the coronary arteries can be severed, inducing a myocardial infarction or heart attack, or the electrical conduction system can be damaged. A thorough explanation of every kind of way the heart can be damaged is well outside the scope of this lecture. A good and fitting example of a fatal stab wound to the heart would be the assassination of Sissi, one of the last Austrian empresses in the year 1898 was murdered by an Italian anarchist using a sharpened file. She was stabbed during a walk on a promenade in Geneva and initially thought that she had only been punched. She then continued the walk for a couple of minutes before collapsing on a ship. The autopsy found that her thorax was punctured to the depth of 8.5 centimeters, breaking a rib, piercing the lung, penetrating the heart with the file coming out at the base of the left ventricle. This is somewhat typical of a fatal stab wound to the heart, although the length of time it takes for the heart function to be, be impeded to the point of unconsciousness and death will obviously vary a lot, depending on the size of the wound. On a more positive note, the first successful surgical treatment of a stab wound to the heart was performed in 1896 by the German surgeon Ludwig Rehn on a 22-year-old gardener when a 1.5 cm long wound in the right ventricle was sutured the day after the stabbing. 
Even today, most stab wounds to the heart are fatal, although there are some studies that show decent in hospital recovery rates that are generally um, better for stab wounds than they are for gunshot wounds. Overall, I think I have sufficiently demonstrated that stab wounds to the heart are not the insta-kill button that many people believe it is. Still, please, try not to get stabbed in the heart. Now, let us continue. When the blood leaves the heart, it does so by being pumped through the aorta, which is the biggest artery of the human body, with a di diameter of 2-3 to three centimeters. It has an ascending part, an arch, and a descending part. When it comes to injuries to blood vessels, it's important to know if we're talking about the high pressure system, i.e. the arteries, or if we're talking about the low pressure system, the veins. The size of the injured vessel is obviously important too. What many people don't think about is that it is also important where an injured vessel can bleed into. When a vessel can freely bleed into a preformed cavity, no pressure can be applied onto the bleeding wound by the blood in the surrounding tissue or a blood clot. As for the aorta, we have a very big high pressure vessel that can freely bleed into the pleural cavity or the pericardial sac, depending on the location of the rupture. Therefore, wounds to the thoracic aorta are some of the deadliest injuries a human being can suffer, typically leading to unconsciousness and subsequently death within a few seconds. You have to remember that the arteries providing blood to the brain leave the aorta right at the arch, so a wound here will lead to an instant and severe drop in blood pressure in the brain. Let's move on to the lungs. The lungs consist of myriads of tiny air-filled sacs. The outside of the lungs, the so-called pleura visceralis, is actually surprisingly tough to cut. For me it's the part when I first start to complain about the lack of sharpness of the knife during an autopsy. Since the lung is pretty elastic and only held in place by the negative pressure in the pleural cavity, it will retract when subject to a penetrating injury or if there are significant amounts of air or blood in the pleural cavity. The presence of air in the pleural cavity is called a pneumothorax. In general, people can survive with only one lung, albeit the capacity to perform physically demanding tasks will be greatly limited. A one-sided pneumothorax can still be deadly, because a wound might form a valve that lets air into the pleural cavity and traps it there. The pleural cavity will then expand and omit pressure onto the venous vessels that lead to the heart, again hindering the blood flow to the heart and keeping it from filling properly. This is called a tension pneumothorax and can be fatal. Also, there are many big blood vessels in the lungs, especially in the parts close to the heart, that can lead to a deadly loss of blood when hurt. Underneath every rib run a vein, an artery and a nerve. A rupture of these arteries can lead to severe bleeding into the pleural cavity. Even a relatively shallow wound can hurt these vessels. In modern times they can occur as a complication of medical interventions like pleural drainage that are used to remove air or liquid from, from the pleural cavity, like what would be done to relieve a pneumothorax. The severe loss of blood may lead to a loss of consciousness that might occur an hour or a day after the injury, depending on the size of the rupture, and will often require blood transfusions. In olden times, these injuries would often have been fatal. Okay, I think we have spent enough time with the chest. There's much more of the body to cover and we only have so much time. We'll continue with the neck. The most obvious place to start is with injuries to the arteries of the neck. Here it is important to know the anatomy first. There are four large arteries in the neck that eventually end up communicating through the circle of villis directly under the brain. This is important because it allows for the compensation of a loss of blood pressure in one of the arteries. However, a cut through both of the carotid arteries 
cannot be compensated and will lead to unconsciousness within a few seconds followed by death. How fast people can be incapacitated in a similar way is regularly demonstrated by rear naked chokes in mixed martial arts, although they are obviously not held long enough to be lethal or cause permanent brain dam damage, hopefully. I unfortunately won't be able to talk much about head or brain injuries. In general, brain injuries may cause a loss of function of the injured parts, either temporary or permanent. Every kind of hemorrhage can become a major problem because the brain is trapped inside the skull and will quickly be compressed and damaged. Especially the brain stem can be pushed against the rim of the foramen magnum, the great hole in the base of the skull. This can lead to damage to the medulla oblongata and death. Significant damage to the medulla oblongata in general will lead to a near instant loss of consciousness followed by death. The medulla oblongata contains, among others, the respiratory and cardiac centers necessary for basic functions like breathing and heart rate or blood pressure control. Injuries to the side of the neck, like during an Oberhau, can disrupt the brachial plexus, the bundle of nerves innervating the arm and lead to a loss of function of that arm. Okay, let's continue with the abdominal cavity. Contrary to most depictions in movies, the small intestines are attached to the posterior abdominal wall by the mesentery, a fatty structure that houses, for example, the blood vessels and nerves supplying the intestines. Thus, a cut through the belly will not cause the intestines to fall out onto the ground, although intra-abdominal pressure can push them out of the abdominal cavity, but they will still be connected to the mesenterium. Ruptures of the intestines will cause stool and its bacteria to enter the ab abdomen and cause a major infection that will often be deadly, especially without antibiotic therapy. A stab wound to the stomach will cause stomach acid and food to leak and cause major necrosis and infection. Similarly, damage to the pancreas that lies directly behind, behind the stomach will cause digestive enzymes to leak into the abdominal cavity and lead to self-digestion and necrosis. Many organs like the liver, spleen and the kidneys are very well supplied with blood and ruptures may lead to a major and potentially deadly loss of blood. How fast this will happen depends on the size of the injury, but it's not likely to happen instantly. Ruptures of the abdominal aorta will lead to a major blood loss that will lead to unconsciousness and death very quickly, but generally not as instantaneous as ruptures of the thoracic aorta. Still, there's a lot of space to bleed into, and it's a big high pressure vessel, so it's going to be over fast. Okay, I think that's all the time we have. I hope that you could take away something from listening to me, and I'll be happy to take some questions. Stay healthy and keep fancying.